Hi everyone. Today I'm talking about hearing loss prevention and how we need to approach this challenge from a number of different angles. When I talk about hearing loss prevention, I'm talking specifically about noise induced hearing loss. And we know that that uh, risk of noise induced hearing loss can come from two sources essentially, from the workplace and also from leisure environments, at least in the pre COVID era when we were still allowed to go to nightclubs and attend music concerts. Research at NAL and, and many other labs around the world over the past few years has shown very clearly how sound levels at, at recreational events can be just as loud as they are in more traditional industrial workplaces. In this graph, the pink lines, the pink bars uh, represent recreational sound levels, while the green bars are uh, workplace levels. And you can see, for example, that a nightclub is just as loud as the sound level that you get from a chainsaw. Similarly, the sound level that you experience in a fitness class uh, is just as loud as the sound level in a sheet metal workshop. And while there hasn't been uh, an epidemic of hearing loss from recreational sources, uh, the research clearly demonstrates that the more recreational noise that a person is exposed to, the more likely they are to exhibit signs and symptoms of hearing damage. And that's particularly true for tinnitus. In the lower graph, you can see that people who report um, always having tinnitus are very likely to um, have high levels of recreational noise doses. And so there's essentially three ways that we can approach uh, hearing loss prevention. The first approach is to take an upstream view. Uh, so this means working at the government level to change policy, to change regulations and legislation. It means working with international organisations to try and make change um, at a systemic level so that you can create safer environments for a really large group of people, whether that's like a national population or even an, an international population. At the midstream, um, activities include uh, approaching schools, doing work in the workplace, um, disseminating information via the media, basically community driven activities where you can still reach large groups of people, but not quite as large a group as you would be reaching um, if in, in the upstream sort of scenario. And then there's also downstream activity that you can do. So downstream refers to uh, reaching individuals on a one-on-one -on -one basis and trying to change the behaviour of, of individuals. And clearly this is a fairly ineffective way to go about trying to, to change um, the dial on hearing loss prevention. It's much more effective to try and work at the upstream level where you can make you know really major changes that affect the health of, of really large groups of people. However, even though upstream uh, work is is effective, it's also really labor intensive and it involves you know a lot of stakeholders and reaching agreement um, from a lot of people who have very diverse views. So it can be really time consuming and it can take many years to to reach an outcome. What I'm going to talk about today is some of the lessons that we've learned from the work that we've done at both the upstream, the midstream and the downstream level. So the first lesson I want to talk about is um, the fact that we've, we've learned that international cooperation can make a difference. So NAL has been involved in the World Health Organization's group called Make Listening Safe since it was formed in 2015. And the World Health Organization estimated that 1.1 billion young people were exposed to unsafe uh, sound levels through their headphones. And so they formed this, this Make Listening Safe group to try and see if we could come up with some, uh, some international agreed standards uh, for how we can better protect uh, people's hearing while they're listening uh, through headphones on their personal listening devices. And after four years of work um, and many meetings um, and, and a lot of effort from a lot of people from a, a wide range of disciplines, um, the group came up with um, some international guidelines. So the Safe Listening Guidelines for Devices and Systems is a joint publication between the World Health Organization and the International Telecommunications Union. And it sets out some minimum standards um, that, that we think should be included um, for people who are listening through to sound through their headphones. Um, it includes ways um, for devices to um, measure sound levels and, and monitor them, and then provide that information to the user. 
And so this is a really good example of how um, you know work at the upstream level can can actually um, lead to tangible differences. One of the really important aspects of this work was that Apple um, has been involved in the in the working group discussions. And so if you look at the latest updates of um, in, in Apple software, you can see that they've actually incorporated these standards into, into their devices. Um, they allow for monitoring of headphone levels and they provide messages when people are listening at unsafe levels. So this is, this is a great example of how um, you can really make a difference when you're working upstream. The next agenda on the item for the Make Listening Safe group is to try and tackle the uh, concept of developing standards for music venues. And we've been heavily involved in this work. We, uh, we um, developed a background paper um, collating all the evidence from the countries which currently have standards for their music venues. So there's it's quite a few uh, countries in Europe that already Im, um, impose standards on their music venues. They require them to um, to meet limits on the on the sound level. They require their sound engineers to monitor the sound levels um, at concerts. They require venues to provide earplugs for patrons, and they also require rest areas um, so that people can take a break from, from loud listening. Uh, and so the aim um, from now on for the Make Listening Safe group is to try and see if we can we can emulate what we've done for the for the personal listening devices and try and create some international standards to, to create safe listening environments for everyone who attends music concerts. An example of some work that we've done at the midstream level is uh, it relates to workplace behaviours and how these can translate into leisure environments. So we conducted a survey of 8,000 people and we asked them about their workplace. Did they uh, experience noise at the workplace and did they use hearing protectors in the workplace? And what we found was that those people who'd been exposed to noise at work, who'd learned about noise exposure at work, who understood the risks of noise exposure and who had used earmuffs or earplugs at work were much more likely to then uh, translate that information, translate that learning, translate that knowledge um, to their leisure environments. And they're five to up to five times more likely to use hearing protectors in, in leisure environments, whether that was at concerts or, or when using tools around the house. So this is a really great example of how activity at the midstream can have a, a, an even wider effect than you might think initially, um, because those behaviours can be translated uh, beyond the workplace into other aspects of the person's life. We've also learned that online tools can be a really effective way of reaching um, a large number of individuals. So while it might be really expensive and time consuming to, to um, reach individuals and try and change behaviour on a one-on-one -on -one basis, the internet provides a fantastic platform to reach large numbers of individuals uh, for a relatively low cost. So back in 2014, we developed a tool called the Know Your Noise Risk Calculator. Um, and we've had many thousands of users log on uh, since that time. And what Know Your Noise is, is a personalised risk calculator. Uh, it's an interactive tool where people um, enter information about the noisy activities that they do, how often they do them and how long they spend doing each one. And then the noise risk calculator calculates uh, that individual's personalised risk profile. It presents that information in relation to their peers, so it compares where they're sitting on the risk um, on the risk um, parameter. Um, so in this example, this person um, is at very high risk. They've got a, a noise risk level of 2.5. And then we demonstrate that, that when you compare that to the group, um, the group's sitting more around one. So this person's obviously at high risk. Um, and most importantly, what the noise risk calculator does is it provides information about the source of that risk. So in this example, this person's risk is mostly coming from attending concerts. And so the person is encouraged to actually go back and um, change their initial answers and, you know, change the, find out what would happen if they change their behaviour. So, for example, perhaps this person goes to concerts on a fortnightly basis. Um, and so they can go in and say, OK, well, what if I only attended concerts on a monthly basis? How would this change in behaviour change my risk profile? And so there's a very real, tangible, personalised um, demonstration of how that person's um, behaviour can alter their risk profile. And we know that providing this information to people is useful um, and then does change people's motivation. So we've conducted a before and after survey and found that before starting the noise risk calculator, about 60% of people told us that they either sometimes or always 
um, act to protect their hearing and reduce their noise exposure. But after doing the noise risk calculator, this number jumped from 60% to 88%. So that's a really significant increase in the level of motivation for people doing this tool. We've also learned that giving access to tools is a more effective strategy than, than providing information. So we studied a, a group of clubbers and we invited them to come um, and meet us and receive a pair of high fidelity earplugs to wear at our clubs. And we had two groups. There was a control group who simply received the earplugs and then another group that received the earplugs, plus they were given some information and some training about noise exposure and, uh, and risks and so on. And what we found was that there was actually no difference between the groups. Both groups were equally likely to change their behaviour, to wear earplugs more often, and both sustained their intention to, um, to, to protect their hearing um, 12 weeks after the, the initial um, time that we, that we interviewed them. And so what this study has shown us is that uh, giving people the tools that they need to act and to protect their hearing is, is a more effective strategy and it's really all that you need if people are motivated already to protect their hearing. Giving them information is, is likely to make a very small difference, if at all. Over the years, we've done a lot of uh, qualitative work, uh, talking to people who protect their hearing and trying to you know, find out exactly why they, they protect their hearing. What are the insights that we can learn? What are the themes there? Um, what, what can we find out about what motivates these people? And then you know, the idea is that we can then use that information to design um, tools and campaigns to, to convince other people to, to take protective action as well. And what we've found through these qualitative interviews is that tinnitus can be a really a salient trigger for people and also people um, who have a really strong love of music and those who can take a long term view of their hearing are, um, are really likely to be the ones who um, have been proactive about taking action to protect their hearing. So we often find that if we talk to someone who's a regular earplug user, they will relay a story about how um, they decided to start using earplugs uh, when their tinnitus got too bad, or when they spoke to a friend who had really bad tinnitus and they realised that they didn't want to end up in the same situation. Um, so tinnitus can be a really, really strong emotional motivator to get to get people to to take um, to take real action. And we also found that people um, who are regular earplug users often identify very strongly as music lovers. They see it as part of their identity and it's something that they want to maintain for the long term. And so these people who can, you know, can see themselves in 10, 20, 30 years time and they realise that they want to maintain their hearing so that they continue their, their love of music, these are the people that are, that are more likely to to be the regular um, protectors of hearing. And so these things are really important for us because um, they're sort of emotional triggers that, that help us um, to design um, tools and activities and interventions um, to help other people also take action. We've also found throughout the years that uh, the media is a really important partner for promoting hearing health and it's a really good way of reaching a large number of people. So these examples come from um, World Hearing Day from 2018. The ABC published a number of studies um, looking at uh, music exposure and the risks that, that come with that. And what we found was that uh, reading the comments was really useful for us. Um, and in particular, we found that there were a bunch of comments uh, where people were indicating that they were taking action as a result of reading uh, these media stories. So there were people who were talking to their friends, tagging their friends, talking about getting earplugs for a concert they were about to go to, reminding their friends to get earplugs, offering to buy earplugs for their friends. And so this was a really encouraging sign that, um, you know, promoting your work through the media can actually have downstream effects and affect behaviour in, in individuals. Um, and really, um, you know, you can see sort of the effect of, of what you're trying to, to promote. And even more encouraging was, was one comment in particular, which pointed out that this was the first feed uh, this person had ever read where other people are saying they wear earplugs at concerts. And this gives us um, a really great sense of encouragement because it suggests that, you know, there, there might be a time when wearing earplugs and protecting hearing and being aware of noise levels will actually become the norm. And we know that people are much more likely to listen to their friends, listen to their peers um, and, and take take notice of the example of their friends rather than listening to scientists or, or academics telling them what to do. And so the fact that, uh, that 
um, promoting your work in the media can have this effect and can suggest that the norms could be changed is a really positive thing for us to be able to see. And so I guess if you take all of our work um, and look at it, look at it as a whole, what's very clear to us is that it aligns really well with the COMBI model. So the COMBI model is a popular health behaviour change model. It's used in lots of different areas of health, not just hearing. And what it says is that in order to change behaviour, what we need to do is enhance and improve and change a person's capability, opportunity and motivation. And it's these three things which will drive behaviour change. What we need to do is resist the urge to educate and instruct and inform. And instead, what we need to do is look for opportunities to try and help people be capable of protecting their hearing, knowing the risks, understanding um, the, the relationship between noise level and duration, giving that capability and the know-how to insert earplugs. These things are all about enhancing capability and they, they are the type of things that are going to lead to, to real behaviour change. Equally, providing opportunities for people to change their behaviour. So if we take the example of earplugs um, at, a, at a music venue, it means having the earplugs visible. It means having them available on the counter, not hidden in a back room. It means making them um, available at a reasonable price so that people can purchase them easily. And of course, motivation is essential. We've seen in our qualitative work that uh, motivating people, appealing to their love of music, appealing to their desire to be able to listen to music for a really long period of time. Those are the types of things that are really strong and salient and emotional and are much more likely to create behaviour change um, than giving people handouts and, and information and you know scientific material. Leads me to the final piece of work I want to talk about um, and this is some recent work that we've been asked to do by the Department of Health and they asked us to look at how we can uh, change hearing health behaviours across the entire population so not just young people in a music setting but across the whole population how can we you know, motivate people to change their, their hearing health behaviours and so we've done a, a big analysis big deep dive if you like uh, looking at the needs and gaps of the Australian population in terms of their capability their opportunity and their motivation to engage in hearing health behaviours and uh, yeah, if this is something that you're interested in, please, please reach out to me after this talk and I'd, I'd be happy to tell you more about it. And so finally, to conclude, um, if we are going to prevent noise induced hearing loss and, and make a difference, uh, what we need to do is, is a whole lot of different activities. We need to think about what we can do at the upstream level. We need to uh, keep active in the midstream, engage with the media and also um, think about what we can do in the downstream and, and try and reach individuals on, on their level. Um, to do that, personalised online tools are a really good way for reaching young adults and, and motivating them to change their behaviour. At the midstream, we know that work, the workplace is a really good place to, to talk to people about noise exposure because it has um, more widespread effects than than just the workplace, it goes beyond that into leisure and recreational settings as well. We know that giving people tools to act is much more important than giving them knowledge. And we know that we need to keep engaging with the media because um, it's a really good way to generate peer-to-peer -peer advice, motivate action, and perhaps even create some new norms. And finally, my main message, prevention campaigns, interventions and activities uh, need to be based on um, trying to enhance a person's capability, opportunity and motivation. And by changing these three things, uh, we'll be able to make effective changes in terms of, of behaviour. And finally, I'd like to finish by thanking my colleague, Megan Gilber, who um, has been an instrumental partner in, in all of the work that I've talked about here today. And of course, I'd like to acknowledge our funders uh, for, for all of this work. So that includes the Hearing CRC and also uh, the Department of Health, which funds much of the work that is done at now. Mm -hmm.